Does this sound familiar to you? You've spent weeks building your Next.js application, deployed it to production, and now users are complaining about the load times. Your Lighthouse scores are in red, your bounce rate is climbing, and you are not quite sure which part of your code is actually causing the problem. I know the feeling because I've been there. So by the end of this video, you'll know exactly which five performance killers to fix so you can cut your loading times in half and keep your users happy. And most developers blame Next.js for being slow when the real problem is how they are using it and that costs them users every single day. But without further ado, let's dive right in. Regular image tags will destroy your performance. When you skip Next.js's image component, you miss out on automatic optimizations, lazy loading, and proper sizing. You, your users uh, download 5 megabyte photos when they only need to download 200 kilobyte versions. Here's what happens when you use standard image tag. You upload a massive PNG and drop it on your page. The browser then downloads the entire file at full resolution, even if the user only sees it at 400 pixels wide on their phone. And without modern formats like WebP or AVIF, you are serving images that are two to three times larger than necessary. You might think that manually compressing images before upload solves, solves this problem, but you'd have to create multiple sizes for different screen resolutions and then maintain them all. And even worse, all your images load immediately when the page opens, even the ones below the fold that users might never even scroll to. I see developers ship apps with hero images that take 8 seconds to load on mobile connections because they never tested on anything slower than their office Wi-Fi. So instead of using the traditional image tag, use the Next.js image component with proper width and height props, enable lazy loading for below the fold images, and let Next.js handle the compression and format conversions automatically. Your image sizes will drop by 60 to 80% without any manual work. Fetching data in use effect creates a wasted round trip. Your component renders, triggers a data fetch, then re-renders with the data. When child components also fetch data, you create a waterfall where each component waits for its parent before making its own request. So here's the exact sequence that happens. The page loads, the React hydrates your component, uh, use effect runs, and then the fetch request starts. And only then does your data begin loading. That's three steps before any data even starts moving. And the problem gets worse when you have nested components that each fetch their own data. Your parent component fetches a list of blog posts, renders the list, and then each child component makes its own fetch request for additional details. If you have 10 posts, that's 11 separate network requests happening in sequence instead of parallel. You might think this is fine because the data loads eventually, but your users are staring at the loading spinners for anywhere between 3 to 5 seconds when they could have seen the content immediately. And here's what nobody mentions. Every one of those use effect fetches happens after your JavaScript bundles download and execute, which means slow connections wait even longer. So instead, use server components and fetch data on the server where it belongs. Your users get the content immediately instead of watching for spinners. Before we continue to the third performance killer, I just want to quickly mention my free five-day course for building SaaS applications. So the chances are, since you're watching this video, that you are building a SaaS apps and want to get better at it. So in that case, click the link in the description to sign up for the free five-day course where I break down the five biggest mistakes web developers make creating real-world applications. And all these mistakes are something I've learned during my 10 plus years as a developer. All right, but Let's continue to the performance killer number three. Every kilobyte of JavaScript you ship is code your users have to download, parse, and execute. The most common culprit is importing entire libraries when you only need one function. 
for example, writing import underscore underscore from Lodash pulls in 70 kilobytes when you probably only needed one two kilobyte function. So here's what actually happens when you import an entire library. You add one line of code that looks innocent, but your bundle size jumps by 70 kilobytes or more. Most developers never check what they are actually shipping until uh, the app starts to feel slow. The worst part is that you are not just importing Lodash, you are probably also importing Moment.js for dates and entire icon libraries when you use five icons, and analytic packages that pull in dependencies you never asked for. Another common mistake is not using dynamic imports for heavy components, like models, charts or admin panels, that users might never even see. All of this JavaScript has to download over the network, then the browser has to parse it and execute it before your page becomes interactive. On mobile devices with slower processors, this parsing and executing execution can take two to three seconds even after the download finishes. So what you should do is, for example, run next build and analyze your bundle with next bundle analyzer to see what's taking up space then use specific imports like import debounce from Lodash slash debounce instead. You can cut your bundle size in half just by being specific about what you import. Backend performance matters just as much as frontend optimizations. The classic mistake is the n plus one query problem. Fetching all list items, then making a separate database call for each item's related data. If you are loading, for example, 20 blog posts and fetching the author for each one in individually, that's 21 queries when it should be two. So here's how it plays out in production. You write a query that fetches all your blog posts. Then you loop through them to display author information. For each post, your code makes another database query to get the author details. If you have 50 posts on the page, you just made 51 trips to the database. Other common mistakes include missing database indexes on columns you frequently query, fetching entire tables when you only need 10 rows, and not using connection pooling so your app creates new database connection on every request. You might think your queries are fast because they work fine in development with 100 rows of test data, but in production with 50,000 rows and no indexes, that same query takes 3 seconds instead of 30 milliseconds. The serverless functions on platforms like Vercel make this worse because each request spins up a new function that has to establish a database connection from scratch. So instead, use an ORM that supports eager loading to fetch related data in one query, add indexes to your frequently queried columns, and always use a limit in your queries. Your API response times will drop from seconds to milliseconds. Analytics, chat widgets, ads, and social media embeds can easily destroy your performance. Loading these scripts synchronously in your document head blocks your entire page from rendering. So users see a blank screen while Google Analytics downloads and executes. Here's what happens when you add a third-party script the default way. You paste the snippet they give you in your HTML head, and now your browser has to stop everything and wait for that external server to respond before continuing. And if you're loading, for example, five to 10 third-party scripts, they are all competing for bandwidth and CPU on the initial page load. A slow analytics script can add two to three seconds to your load time. And if their server is having issues, your entire page is stuck waiting. I've seen perfectly fast apps become unusable because a chat widget took eight seconds to load and blocked everything else. You might argue that you need these tools for business reasons, and that's fair, but you don't need them to load before your actual content shows up. And most third-party scripts don't need to run immediately. Your analytics won't break if they start tracking two seconds after the page loads instead of immediately. So always use Next.js script component for third-party scripts with the strategy prop set to lazy on load or after interactive. So these scripts load after your main content. Your users get the working page immediately, 
and the tracking scripts load in the background. I know we touch pretty lightly on each topic in this video. So if you'd like to see an in-depth tutorial on some of these points, just let me know in the comments. But I hope you found this video at least somewhat helpful. And if you did, please leave a like and hit the subscribe button below if you haven't already.